Well, <clears throat> first of all, it's lovely to be here to meet you. Um, wisdom is always interesting because whenever you think you have, you are wise, you realise you there's many more things to explore. Um, I'm a dyslexic polymath, which may sound strange to you, but <clears throat> I'm a sort of physicist and mathematician and many other things. But most of all, it's a journey of discovery, discovery in me in the sense that there are times when you fail and things don't seem to go so well, but then realising that's an opportunity to learn and move on. And I think for many young people on the threshold of their career, it's realising that life is a staircase. You have times of stability, times when you are not so stable and times when you have to climb the, climb the next stair. And for me, that's been a journey over many years. My passion is really about trying to find self-sustaining solutions, um, particularly for people, organisations and communities. And I think that's part of, for people, it's about discovering who they are recognizing who they are and building on their self-worth because if you can create the light inside people can see where they're going can avoid sometimes the mishaps and can be comfortable with their search for meaning i think in many ways we find that that journey often can be facilitated by people around you by people of different ages different disciplines but most of all it's your journey and if you have optimism, you have hope, and you move towards a place of, of expression that is very meaningful, if you fall into the trap of fear, then it's very easy to get into learned helplessness. And for many young people, they project into displacement worlds because they can't deal with the world in which they, they're in. And that's the, we see this as a drug abuse, substance abuse, and many other things. But it's really that they have to live in a fantasy rather than living in the world which is real. So for me, it's about helping people at, at any level to have that journey, to have meaning in their lives and to move forward. And then increasingly, we're trying to find how we can combine and integrate interventions in health, education and enterprise to actually build truly self-sustaining uh, individuals and communities and organisations and to live in a world where there is hope, there is, uh, I would say, unselfish love as a pathway to improvement. And in the technical terms, we're, we're looking at nanomedicines to try and improve health. But more importantly, we're looking at lifestyle changes. Because if you look at medicine, uh, we tend to fix things after the problems occurred. If you look at um, improving quality of life, 40% of health outcomes are a function of state of mind. If you improve state of mind, often you don't get into the negative health paradigm, but also you actually create a resonance field around you and around the people that you are with, which creates this positivity and this can-do culture. In the field of education, we've been breaking down the frontiers of some of the paralysis and mindsets that there are in education. I think we're moving away, and I think COVID-19 has proven that you don't necessarily have to go into a conventional classroom to learn. And the problem has been the mindsets of the teachers as well as perhaps the, the students. And we've, using the latest developments in neuroscience, we're discovering that if you educate through joy, you open up the amygdala and the information flows straight into the prefrontal cortex and the cingulate gyrus so that you actually have meaning in education and you learn on the first pass most teachers work on the principle of saying the same thing seven times, which is pretty boring to them and pretty boring to the teachers, to the students. If you can do it on the first pass and celebrate the curiosity of people of any age and to allow them to feel the joy of learning, then they will always remember that item with pleasure and not feel the pain. Most people, when they've been through a painful education experience, can only remember pain, so they never want to go back into that learning space or that particular piece of information because of the pain stigma. And then finally, this whole area of enterprise, which is sort of creating the entrepreneurial flair in people, the ability to create value. And in today's world, that may be blockchain, it may be many other things, 
but we are living in a world which is changing very rapidly and the impact of AI and robotics and so on will mean that people will have to change careers many times and to be prepared for this new world we have to be able to celebrate new skills. In the past command and control has meant that you evolved into a management system or a system which was governed by rules. Today the world is changing so fast there may not be rules so we have to work on participation and trust that means building empathy, empathetic relationships and building trust and meaning and inspiring leadership as opposed to just being leaders by position or by authority. This also then extends into communities whereby um, I believe that probably small is beautiful in a way where what we find is when you get above about 500 people, people tend to lose touch with each other and you start to have more and more uh, systems of control, rules, bureaucracies, justice systems and so on. But up until about 500 people, people can naturally con control themselves. The, the locus of control and the locus of concern are pretty much identical. Therefore, I believe we can experiment in creating a new type of community which is independent, that grows its own food, has its own power, has its own water supply, and move away from fear and move away to move to a point of celebrating life. And this becomes even more important in our search for meanings. So the true smart village or smart city is around not just having a physical environment that's smart, but in an environment that allows people to celebrate their, who they are and what they are and pass that on to generations. We need to hear, listen to our children calling from the future now at this incredibly critical time and choose harmonious living rather than living where the few gain a lot and the many have very little. I believe we're in a time where I see five key vectors. One is the development of our own personal integrity, the discovery of our internal power, and then manifesting that external power wisely in an environment which is safe, because safety is key, and serene in the sense of calm. I believe it's a fabulous opportunity for women. I mean, one of my colleagues, Kristen Envig, was speaking earlier, who's one of the founders of the Women's International Network. And I believe this is a time of balance for both the masculine and feminine to find this joint purpose. I think in terms of currencies, this is also very interesting where we move away from a mechanistic type of currency to a currency which has meaning. And I think in the Marshall Islands, because of the local nature, that currency will have meaning to the people rather than just being a, a debt-driven fiat vehicle. I think in that we are at a, a point of time when we're able to create resonance. And I think resonance is the key that we resonate individually and collectively to, de to define something better that can be shared by many people. I think in the Wisdom Accelerator, we have had the chance to learn from young people who are still in the developing phase, but their wisdom is quite extraordinary. Uh, I'm very much humbled by the intelligence not just physically, but physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually of the Generation Z. And we are at a time when I think we have the opportunity to change the world, but change the world without revolution, change the world through evolution. Happy to answer any questions. Guys, if you want to know more about the way and others, that's a good opportunity to ask questions because Ryson has seen it all. I mean, maybe one observation which might be interesting is um, many of the young people that came on the way program um, were exceptional, exceptionally intelligent or coming from very gifted, very gifted in many ways and gifted families. But the one common denominator ranging from people that had very high net worth to people who had very little was self-worth. And we find that if you can find a way, a pathway for people to discover their self-worth and their meaning, that's probably the most important journey of all. 
and to also celebrate difference. You know, we're, we're all different in one way or another. And by not labeling people, recognizing that we are just dealing with human beings that have different aspects, that I think is probably one of the most powerful things in a way that within a very short time, people were just human beings working and playing together. And I think the, the other thing is really that the WAY program is all about fun. So whilst there are opportunities to access speakers that you would not normally come across, there's also a massive amount of fun in creating, in being part of joint ventures. Uh, at one occasion, building an igloo, I think was probably one of the things that I've never done before. And uh, shall we say that the camaraderie and the humor, I think humor is the great lubricant of life, was, uh, was great. I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm an expert in building igloos, but it's another string to my bow. Well, and the sledging experience and the cross-country skiing, I mean, you, you have your fair share of stories. Uh. Well, I think what the sledging is where they, you're sitting on this sledge and you think it's going to go about 100 meters. And in my case, I'm not the lightest of people, so I was sitting on the back and there was a girl on the front and uh, shall we say it was a dragster when the whole thing is, uh, you know, at about a 45 degree angle, you don't actually go very far. So I went on the front and she went on the back and we pushed off. They hadn't mentioned it was a two kilometer run um, with fairly sheer drops on either side. And uh, I found myself moving up the sledge. And if, you're, if you could imagine you're sitting on the bars on the front, end, front of a sledge, pulling these pieces of string to try and steer. Uh, I think uh, Davos was introduced to one or two interesting Anglo-Saxon expressions. <laughs> Yeah, it, it got salty on the snow. Yeah, salty on the snow is probably very appropriate. And then this year we had uh, survival training uh, in the forest during winter. I mean, we, we picked Davos for so many reasons. Uh, I've been going there during the West for a very long time, and next year is going to be my 10th uh, edition. So I, I know the tricks of the trade and what's doable and how. Um, and now the, uh, the big challenge is really a, a shifting way uh, into a more global perspective. And I was talking about that this morning, like um, how come we ended up having an online version? And the fun part that Royce mentioned was really the biggest challenge is like, how can I really create something online that is as much fun as building igloos and learning how to rescue someone from an avalanche and uh, survival in the forest? And yeah, we just... Uh, uh, crowdsourcing that to the teenagers. So the uh, play breaks, uh, they always planned and uh, led by the teenagers, uh, which is uh, what's going to happen now. I mean, we um, uh, a few minutes late, but I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, they'll be okay uh, catching up. And um, it works quite well. And the uh, silver lining, the blessing of this uh, remarkably productive pandemic when it comes to you know, new ideas, uh, having a chance to see the daylight, is that um, you know, by chance and experience of traveling around a lot, um, I kind of managed to figure out what are the ideal times to be able to uh, reach any teenager around the world. And that's what we're doing, right? So uh, it doesn't matter where you live on the planet, uh, you can join the sessions for at least four hours uh, a day, both on Saturday or Sunday. If you happen to be in EMEA, so Europe, uh, Middle East, and Africa, you can watch uh, for eight hours, so every single session. And we have a couple of participants here who do that, and they do that very enthusiastically. But um, oh, if the pandemic hadn't happened, uh, we would have been doing the Wisdom Accelerator in Singapore uh, this month, and we just keep on going down that path, but we'll be missing this uh, kind of branch uh, in terms of opportunities in life that was the creation of an online version that is much more inclusive. So um, your participation here is speakers, parents, volunteers, uh, and uh, you know all the other people that belong to the ecosystem of what we are doing in this community. You know, it's absolutely um, you know, most welcome. Um, people who are here, they're here because they want to be. There's no obligation. No, no one is uh, getting paid or uh, getting uh, rewards or any type of sorts. It's very uh, genuine and uh, it shows, right? And it's uh, a self-filtering system that attracts people that have a similar um, intention and background, which makes it a much more uh, powerful community. And the fact that you're going all over the globe, 
um, you know, kids that are in uh, the Marshall Islands. I'm hoping that we can get a whole bunch of them to come and join us uh, next month because we're doing them once a month. I was in the last weekend. And uh, yeah, we just carry on uh, trying to figure out uh, what is wisdom for each person and how they can grow uh, individually. And uh, uh, luminaries like uh, Royston are uh, showing the way, at least uh, you know, shedding some light so that people can find their own path. So thank you very much for joining, uh, Royston. And of course, you're, you're most welcome to help us uh, you know, solve jigsaw puzzles and charades as well. I'd like to join us for the play break. Royston, uh, uh, sorry. There's there's still time to to ask a question. Of course. Okay, so Ruston, you, you said uh, five five thousand people in a community, and uh, I remembered uh, Plato's uh, Republic. Did <laughs> you did you took uh, this number from from this book from his book? I I, th I think basically wisdom is about rediscovering it. We don't invent it. Uh, so wisdom has been there for a long time. Um, what you find is that as communities get very big, they become more and more bureaucratic. People lose touch with each other. The natural mechanisms for healing wounds, healing conflict tend to be become paralyzed. We've, we've, we've particularly found that if you have people in groups of three, with a role of storyteller, listener, and observer, um, which dissipates the process for education. It's a very powerful, powerful process of people living together, and it's a powerful process for learning together and working together. So what we are doing is looking at ways of creating resonance fields. And I think Plato probably had a good idea about it. If you remember, Plato and Socrates went to the Elysian fields where they found wisdom by plugging into higher levels of intelligence. I wouldn't suggest that I've plugged into the higher level of intelligence, but sometimes it grips up on me. Okay. Thank you for, for being here. Your, your, your talk was, was awesome. Thank you. And uh, I would say that I, I don't know how many um, Brazilian 13-year-old teenagers uh, can quote uh, Plato's Republic, but I surely hope that all of them will be joining the community. You know? So please send them our way. Uh, that's um, the, the kind of spirits that I want to have. And um, again, along the, the Platonic uh, line, uh, way is in many ways uh, the, um, the, the shadows that you can see, right? We're just trying to make sure that people can get out of the cave and have a look outside and then make up their mind. Like, uh, do they want to go back to darkness and um, see life as um, shadows that are potentially manipulated by people who can control them? Or do they want to see the world in 4D, like the three dimensions plus the time, uh, so that you observe the changes that happen to those dimensions? And I, I hope we all 4D kind of people here, and uh, I'm trying to identify the 4D individuals uh, from around the world of that age range. And uh, yeah, so your participation, uh, again, is uh, fantastic. I don't want to take much more time from their play break because they only have 12 minutes left. But um, thanks again, Royston. With, um, oh, your help is uh, really amazing, as always been for the last two years now. And uh, no, we're deeply honored to have you as a member, a founding member of the community. My pleasure. All right, so uh, back to uh, the real bosses here, you know, the, the two staff gang leaders, Alexia and Natasha, what, what's in store for the play break? Um, so we're just going to start off with a quick introduction, but since most of us have already been on these Zooms, we're just going to say our name, our age, and where we're from. So Mark, do you want to start? Natasha, can you put that in the chat so that everybody knows what they're supposed to do? Yeah. Thank you. And after this, we'll play Scribblio. 